how do I use this? Ah, okay. So let's take a walk down memory lane about state machines. I think that an interesting place to start is with the Allen Turing, the Turing machine or the A machine. Um, while finite state automata was a concept in mathematics since before then, I am not a math mathematician, so I can't speak very well for that. But for people who are brand new to this theory, essentially, you have a machine, and you have an alphabet. So here we can see this alphabet in the example contains only one and zero. So it's a two-letter alphabet, right? Here we have a two-letter alphabet, and here we have a state machine. So the Turing machine, or the A machine, essentially will have an infinite tape input. It will read one symbol from the alphabet, and that will cause the state machine to change state. And as a result, it will stamp a new symbol on the position on the tape. And an interesting uh, property of the Turing machine itself is that as a result, it, the depending on the current state that the state machine will be in, it can also move the tape back and forward a certain number of, of slots, right? So that is essentially more or less what happens with the Turing machine. Later on, um, we have the Moore machine. So this is basically just a representation of a state machine. And in the Moore machine, you can still consider this as in those days we were basically doing calculations on tapes. So we had a lot of tape. And we're thinking about inputs. Here we have ones and zeros as inputs. And we have states. And the property of the Moore machine is that the output is determined by the current machine state. And then the Mealy machine, which was around the same time by George Mealy, um, basically we can represent the same state machine. However, the difference is that the output is determined by the transition from one state to another. Right? So that's basically they're basically the same thing. You have states, a finite number of states, which, which can exist in your state machine. You have transitions, and you have inputs, and you have outputs. Just that the Miele machine, the outputs are determined by the transition. Right. Enter our favorite hero, David Harrell. And that was when we started, when we started having this thing called state charts. And these first two lines on the slide are two papers. The, origin, the first one, a visual formalism for complex systems, is essentially the definition by David Harrell of what are state charts. And the second one is a recommended reading, tells you about why and how state charts were created. So an interesting thing is that Harrell was essentially hired to work in an uh, avionics company in Israel, and he was working on a fighter jet. And he was trying to figure out what are the requirements for a very complex system. So you had basically, he was working with a 2,000 page document of a line by line description of what should happen in which circumstance. So he would come and he would ask, so what happens when you press, press this button? And then they would have to call somebody and somebody new. And then by the time, OK, so what happens when you press this button and the targeting system is air to air or air to ground, and then something different happens? And there's all these different conditions under which this button actually does something different. And in the end, sometimes there was some low-level programmer who had to make the decision because nobody knew, and it wasn't in the requirements, right? So from his perspective, he ended up creating this chart system 
because it was an easier way to communicate between these experts in order to define how a system actually works, right? And a side effect of this is that we ended up with a visual formalism that could actually be compiled and execute code. So let's move on and see what's on the slide. Right, so I'm going to try to quickly go over what are the properties of Herald state machines. Essentially, now we're, instead of talking about inputs and outputs, we're talking about events and actions, right? So we have a reactive system, a button is pressed, and perhaps uh, the wing flap has to move, right? And that is, a, that is a reaction, that is an action that takes place because of an event depending on the current system state, which is basically how we, we created this, or how they started to think about designing this, right? Um, yes, yeah, so essentially what's to take home here is that when an event occurs, it's merely and a more combined because the action can occur because of a transition and the action can occur as well because you've entered a state, right? So that's essentially it. And uh, the action can also occur when you leave the state. Um, in, the first, in the first model up above, we can see that we have uh, state one, state two, state three. State one and state two both transition to state three in the case of the B event, but then we, or Harold started adding this hierarchy kind of uh, concept and said we can simplify a very complex system and how to describe it by placing two states in a hierarchy and say, well, if the B event occurs, then we transition to state three. And in the other example, we can say, well, perhaps we don't care whether we're entering state one or state two from the perspective of state three. So we have a, a concept of abstraction. And we can say, when we enter this state, well, there's a default state, which is S1. And that state by itself can determine what happens when you enter that state, right? So we can, we can reduce the amount of arrows in a, in a huge complex system. And similarly here, we've, he has introduced orthogonality, right? So in this case, basically you have a light control, color of the light, whether the light is flashing, whether it's constant. And of course you would need to have nine different states if you didn't have orthogonality to represent the same number of machine states. Um, and he added history. So I'm just going to try to quickly go over all of the different features, right? History is, this, this example basically says, okay, for example, you have one of those old watches and you can like press one button to cycle through the different controls that you have and you have the other button to actually choose something. So for example, you press the A button and you get into the alarm chime control state and then you press the B button and it will change the what is your alarm chime. And when you leave the, the chime control state, because it is a history state, it will remember where you were the next time in, right? So that's history states. Um, and we have different kinds of transitions. So we can add conditions because now we're integ integrating with code. So any kind of uh, transition can have a function that says no. If I return false, then don't take this transition, right? And then we have implicit, so the first one is of course event transitions, which is what we've all been talking about so far. And we have some automated kinds of events like timeout states to say, well, the system re stays for 1,000, for one second in this state and then continues, right? Or of course, what's interesting in a event-based program is idle states because then when the system or when the event loop becomes idle, then we can have an idle transition. 
right? And of course, we have transient, transient transitions, right? So that's also a bit different from previous state machines. So even without any events occurring, these transitions will be followed. Um, what is interesting also, or what is, what is interesting to consider is when you have orthogonality and you have transient transitions, the state machine should synchronize should synchronize the transient transitions to ensure that in each active orthogonal state, only one transit like one transition has been followed, and then in the next step, we can evaluate the next transitions and continue on. Right. So. Um, after the Harrell state machines, of course, UML became popular. Now, I haven't, I, I've heard before that UML was coming from this, but then when I did my research, I couldn't find a link. I know that Harrell state, Harrell had added the state chart semantic to UML. I found relevance of that, but essentially, the big difference between unified modeling languages and uh, state machines or, or state charts is that while Harrell had conceived of this in order to analyze requirements, um, he had come up with something that was fully specified, but UML in general is not used in such a way that is fully specified. It's more used just to communicate um, requirements in design phase in waterfall development models and so we we analyze the requirements using uml and we pass it down the chain and people write code right um so that is generally uml i'm sure that i'm missing some things <laughs> so why should i use state machines because you know, I like my indentation and I like my tabs instead of spaces. And I really love Emacs, not VI. And unlike you, right? Um, so why use state machines, right? So state machines give you a different way of thinking about code. And I've really enjoyed using state machines, but there are some actual good reasons. So I'm gonna come back to this example a couple of times during the talk. This is just a basic example of how to code a clicked event when you're writing a button widget in any kind of user, user interface toolkit. You basically have to handle four callbacks. So there is when the mouse comes into your button area and then there's the event of whether the mouse click has gone down or the mouse click has come up, right? Now, in this case, we can see that you need to actually record these two states, right? And when the button is released, that's when you're going to do your branching statement and you're gonna to decide to emit clicked, right? Of course, the more states that your code is keeping track of, and the more events that you have to handle, all of this state needs to be considered in almost every callback, and you have a combinatorial explosion of very complex branching statements. And, uh, right, so that, that, is, that is unfun. Of course, in object-oriented programming, we've kind of tried to address that problem with abstract classes and specialization and then things like this, but state charts are fun, right? So if you were to do it with the state chart, this would be your, your state chart. And in this case, you really only have one state. So this is a single hierarchical state machine or state chart. Now there's one, two, three, four, five, but there's a bunch of pre-programmed you know, possible states. There's actually three possible states, but you only have one state pointer. And the machine is either in that state or, or it is not. So in fact, it, it can be less memory intensive 
if, if done that way. So it, essentially, there's stat static data which defines the model, and then there's only one pointer which says this is the state, right? So in this case, you just need to feed the events into the state machine, and you have one callback that says, okay, when I go from down to up and I'm inside the button, it's clicked, right? So this does one interesting thing that I found, well, I find that it's much more safe and deterministic to code this way because as your program evolves and state gets added, you have this guarantee that such and such event cannot happen and cannot be handled in this state, which gives you, it reduces the amount of, of branching statements and, and cause for error which can happen. Arguments to be had later on, if you wish. Um, so why don't we see this? How come we don't see, we see so much code, but we don't see these state machines so much? Well, I have some answers for that. Um, of course, the object-oriented push in the late 90s. Everybody loved C++. Um, but let's skip over that. Basically, there's two brands of adaptations of state charts that I've seen, and one of them is essentially the, the famous Rational Rhapsody, which uh, essentially it does everything, right? So I, I think that the, I think it was even doing controlling threading for orthogonal states, and it has like it renders to multiple programming languages, and it does code generation for absolutely everything. If I'm not mistaken, it also does uh, revision control and all of this, which of course, by the year 2000, we we're growing out of CVS and we we're saying, well, I want to use Git, right? Or I want to use, you know, BitKeeper and then Git. And then how come I'm stuck with this big monstrous thing that like, okay, it's, it's actually really great and really magic, but you have to have all of it or nothing, right? And then the other, the other approach is we have libraries which cause you to, to write add state, add state, add state, at program initialization time. So you have many calls in C or C++, like in the Qt implementation which I've seen a lot used in automotive. So what I found is that the complaints in the automotive industry using the Qt implementation was that you have some people writing the state charts in the Qt designer tools and then using UML, and then you have other people writing code, adding states, and then you have people three years down the line who've added variables in the same module, dancing around the state transitions, and it ends up being quite a spaghetti mess um, because you, you've not enforced that, you've not enforced that the callbacks are actually triggered by the state machine and you've added state and it's all competed in, competing in the same code, right? Which is also not fun. How I wish I had water. Uh, okay, so let's just switch the topic. Um, oh, I have water. It's not mine. Thank you so much. Hopefully you're not falling asleep. Okay, so let's talk about another state machine implementation. So this is the state chart designer theater. Um, this is a picture of this very, very simple UI, which I just baked up recently, of theater editing itself. Um, we'll get back to that if we have time. So, right, so this is a spin-off of a larger project which I started with Munir Kenfir in 2009. He had the brilliant idea of 
marrying a finite state machine editor and engine with a user, user interface designer tool and to bring it all into one, which uh, we started together and then it took like four years of my coding to make it actually do something. And in the end, I made the same huge monstrosity of code generation, which I couldn't really cause anybody to use, especially since I didn't have that IBM Salesforce, which Rhapsody had, which you could say, use, <laughs> use this huge thing. So, so that kind of didn't work out for me. So I revived it quite recently. And uh, essentially, I'm, I'm looking at it from a perspective of like, uh, like Next Step or Glade or Qt Interface Designer, we should have code and state charts separate in the same way that we have code and user interface design XML files and such separately. So essentially, the way we would use theater is that you will design a state chart, design the brain of your project or your object, and save it as a JSON file, right? Right now, um, the code generators are coming, but uh, the code generator will not generate everything. It will just generate a dot .a definition of your state machine and with references to callbacks that you can provide. And this comes down to different implementation layers that are need to be different for different environments, right? Um, but in this case, I just created the the layer that I needed to bring up the to bootstrap the designer tool, right? Um, if we were to have some Python, for example, if I had a Python layer, the code for that button example would essentially look something like this. Possibly, possibly we could even get rid of the enter notify, leave notify forwarding events, depending on how much introspection the, the loading engine can have with, with the Python like toolkit environment, for example, if, well, if it had derived from a widget class and then the event name were matched, you could with Python, you can basically crawl the whole data structure of your of your object class, and you can you can bind it quite like this. But essentially, you just have to load the cursor, define your callback, forward the events, and say clicked, and then the state machine would do everything for you, right? Is oh there? Okay, it's the end. Oh, well then, I'll skip over this. I, I was looking for the, the somebody writing the how many minutes I had left, and you were all the way over there. Oh my, okay. So you can get the code and look at it and criticize it. And if you have a Linux laptop, you can install the tool right now if you have Flatpak. And uh, enjoy. <laughs>